Red Cave Podcast. Reading tonight from Tales from the Cracks, number 13 through 15. Starting with The Devils in the Tide, followed by Invitation to an Exorcism, and concluded with VR Becomes Her. When you go walking by night up a street and a man, visible a long way off, for the street mounts uphill and there is a full moon, comes running toward you, well, you don't catch hold of him. Not even if he is a feeble and ragged creature. Not even if someone chases yelling at his heels, but you let him run on. For it is night, and you can't help it if the street goes uphill before you in the moonlight. And besides, these two have maybe started that chase to amuse themselves. Or perhaps they are both chasing a third. Perhaps the first is an innocent man and the second wants to murder him and you would become an accessory. Perhaps they don't know anything about each other and are merely running separately home to bed. Perhaps they are night birds. Perhaps the first man is armed. And anyhow, haven't you a right to be tired? Haven't you been drinking a lot of wine? You're thankful that the second man is now long out of sight. Franz Kafka The Devil's in the Tide The waves crashed steadily over the beach like a pressing hand. The salt water retracted back, leaving the sand smooth and new. Each time the waves swept over the sand, they erased all crevices or imperfect footprints. Each time the waves kept making the beach whole again. Jerry watched the last of his footprints disappear into the brand new sculpted sand, his thoughts raging. He stared up into the darkening sky and could already hint the oncoming rain. It always rained, it seemed, just like yesterday and the day before that. He was visiting Cower, Rhode Island, that night, or for that week, for one reason and one reason only. He was there to be with his fiancée Elaine just for two weeks. She was attending State Cower University for the semester, and Elaine had told him she had vacation time coming up that March if he wanted to fly on up. Jerry wasn't going to college, not at the moment. He wanted to take a year off before he did so because high school was about all he could bear. He needed a break, but Elaine had been eager to attend college and Cower U seemed to be her calling. She had lived in Rhode Island all her childhood and wanted to be closer to her mother. So Jerry let her go, and six months later, here he was, both of them staying at her mother's until her two weeks break was up. A week had gone by at Elaine's old household, and he made do for her. But there was only one week left with her, and he'd have to fly back to Colorado and wait one month for her semester to be over. Then from there, she'd fly back to Colorado for the wedding. The next day, Elaine told Jerry they would go out to eat together and then put together a list of people who would attend the wedding. She had hopped in the shower and Jerry darted past her parents and went for a quick walk on the beach. As he walked, he thought about how he had woken up that morning to find a new pair of dockers slung across the chair by Elaine's old desk. On the desk was a box of new shoes, a pair of loafers. Still, Elaine's parents were trying to change his appearance. Jerry stared out at the sparkling ocean and started to get chills running up and down his spine. He strode to the shore and let the cool water seep over his toes. He kicked off his sandals and stepped away from them. They were old and beaten, and he could admit that he had needed new ones. Their soles were peeling off, and the Velcro had long ago lost its stick. He threw the two battered sandals into the curling waves and watched the current slowly take the bobbing dots deeper outwards. Then Jerry walked back to meet Elaine and hoped when he came in he wouldn't see her mother sitting at the kitchen table with sharp scissors to cut his long hair. Invitations were bought and the list of people to be invited were made after lunch. Elaine noticed the loafers on Jerry's feet and she was stupefied. What's up with those? Where's your sandals? Elaine asked, brushing back her long red hair. I decided to pitch the sandals, but I'll get new ones, Jerry answered. Good, because loafers aren't a good look for you. We paid the bill at the restaurant and went home. Elaine later helped prepare dinner and Jerry scooted out. He crossed the boardwalk and stopped. A rabbit lay dead in the middle of the street, its lower half smashed into a pancake. The slightest hint of its guts were poking out of its slack mouth. Jerry winced unpleasantly. He loved animals. That was part of the reason he was a vegetarian, and whenever he saw something like that, he felt his hippie side cry out dismay and bitter longing. He stepped over the roadkill and paused on the beach. He made his way to the shore, searching for what wasn't there. After scanning the entire beach, he realized that he was late for dinner. He gave up on the hunt and made his way for the boardwalk. A heavy crashing wave startled him and forced him to turn. Once the tide had started to pull back in, a new blanket of smooth sand and a pair of sandals were revealed. 
Jerry jogged toward them and inspected the footwear. Even though the sandals had just been brought in from the ocean, they were completely dry and brand new. The soles were reattached, all the stitching was replaced, the Velcro was stickier than ever, and the padding inside wasn't worn out like before. Jerry looked down upon his shoes, perplexed, sweat dripping down his brow furiously. He flipped off the loafers and jumped into the sandals, fresh and somehow renewed. He tossed the loafers into the trash, deciding he better make for home. Then he came across the dead rabbit again, and his heart filled with dread. Such a poor, small creature, such an unexpected loss. Then he stopped, his train of thought thinning away. He hovered over the rabbit that lay in its own blood, his sweat running off his nose and chin. Without a second thought, he bent down and scooped the dead creature in his hands. He was going to find out for sure. He was going to prove to himself once and for all if this was real or not. He sprinted back to the beach, the dead rabbit's head lolling lifelessly between his palms, blood pooling around his fingers. He crouched down on the wet sand, the waves spreading out around his knees. His hands lowered to the water and he relaxed his fingers. The rabbit floated there in the current, dazed eyes staring up blankly at Jerry. Its ragdoll body was slowly but surely pulled into the tide, each minuscule wave pushing the rabbit's corpse deeper into the current. Jerry watched the barely noticeable gray smudge on the horizon blink out as if it had been brutally pulled into the depths. Jerry knew that was crazy because the spot the rabbit disappeared was within standing depth, so there was nothing that could have plucked a rabbit from the waves, could there? It just sank, that's all, he thought, but Jerry wasn't sure. Where the rabbit had been came an explosion of air bubbles that plumed up to the surface quickly and just like that they were gone. The next morning, Jerry sat down at the breakfast table, gnawing on a piece of toast. Elaine left the table to clean herself up, so it was Jerry and Elaine's parents alone at the table. When Elaine was past earshot, her father turned towards Jerry, squinting through his bottle top glasses. Jerry dropped his toast and locked eyes with the old man. Listen, Jerry, I love my daughter, and I love you in a sense, the old man said graciously. I don't know, though. I get the impression that you don't care for us too much, and I've tried to like you since I met you last December, but you're not giving me enough to work off of. Jerry only sat stunned. We're only trying to help, the old lady chimed in. We want what's best for our daughter, and we're trying to help her see the best of you. She already knows the best part of me, Jerry countered. She loves me for who I am. Yes, but are you sure you need to walk around the way you are? You look like a bum, she said in a small voice. What does it matter the way I look? Jerry snapped. Do you have to only eat salads all the time? I mean, what kind of man doesn't eat meat? The father barked. A conscious man, Jerry burst up. It's just our daughter has only been eating vegan and that can't be healthy, her mom whispered. It's very healthy. I won't have my daughter marrying a no-good tree hugger. Jerry's face fell and Elaine's mother burst into tears. Now the gloves were off. They didn't resent him for his appearance, but because of his lifestyle. These people had the nerve to question his beliefs and his love. If you want to marry my daughter, you have to think about a better way to live. Get a job for God's sakes. Go to college and give up that whole flower power crap. You're 20 years old, Gerald. Grow up. Then her father was silent, his eyes directed to his lap. Jerry only turned away and burst out the front door. Jerry? Honey? Elaine yelled out, following him down the walkway. Jerry didn't answer. He crossed the street and made for the boardwalk, but he stopped on the other side of the road, his heart pounding, his ears still ringing from Elaine's screeching cry. There the rabbit stood by the entrance to the boardwalk. Its beady eyes focused on him with sheer concentration. Its fur looked finely combed and completely dry, yet it stared at him like it knew who he was, like it knew he had saved it. Jerry wasn't entirely sure it was the same rabbit until it started to hop away with a limp on the leg that had once been smashed into its mangled fur. Jerry gasped and the rabbit reared its head back at him, its floppy ears swinging. Water started to pour out of its eyes like tears and out of its nose in long streaks. Then it seemed to smile at him, its ugly mouth slack. Water streamed out like a spigot pooling around the sidewalk. Jerry? He turned around swiftly and saw it happen so quickly he didn't even have time to comprehend it. A car came within inches of hitting her, but at the last second the jeep swerved around her, the driver honking and cursing at Elaine as she sprinted across the street. She jumped forward as the car passed and one flailing foot went into the gutter, feet from where Jerry stood. Her legs snapped at the shin and she teetered over the gutter, her foot lodged, while the other slipped out from under her. Jerry jumped, but she hit the concrete and hard. Her head smashed into the sidewalk and it did not bounce. It just stuck there, blood splattering the street. 
Jerry got down to his knees and lifted her up, listening to the snap of her shin as he raised her up to eye angle. Her head lolled onto her shoulder, her skull exposed, her cranium gushing blood like a fountain. Her eyes remained closed, her mouth slightly agape. He searched for a pulse and found a fleeting one. He started to get up to run back to inform her parents when his eyes caught the rabbit again. This time it was on the driveway of Elaine's house, grinning human-like, water still seeping out from between its yellow, green teeth. Jerry scrambled onto the street with Elaine's upper body still balanced on his forearm. He reached down into the blood-soaked gutter and wrenched Elaine's sneaker from the grate. Then he scooted back onto the sidewalk and lifted his fiance into his arms. He checked her pulse again on her neck, then on her wrist, and got a fluttering beat. He sobbed as he started back for the house. But the rabbit sat on the front porch this time by the open door, black button eyes never leaving Jerry. He turned to the boardwalk and to the beach beyond. He looked back at the house and the rabbit was gone. He nodded as if to answer the rabbit's unasked question. He pivoted and took off toward the beach, passing only a few beachers who watched him with shocked, bulging eyes. He continued on, though, his dying fiancé swinging briskly in his trembling arms. Her shorts and blouse were now drenched with blood. Her sneaker was now stained red, even though it had once been white. All the way he sobbed as the orange sun set behind him. He splashed into the water, stumbling and slipping through huge splashes of salt. His foot sank into the soft sand, but still he splashed powerfully through the current. Waves smashed him on the thighs like small fists, and somewhere in the chaos he lost his sandals again. Soon he was wading up to his chest, his clothing sticking to him like adhesive. That's where he carefully laid Elaine down into the water, his tears dripping on her creased forehead. She immediately started to sink, her legs first, and then her chest. He yelped out as he pushed her dead weight away from him. He pressed his ice-cold hands onto his face as Elaine drifted further and further away from him. All that was exposed on the surface was Elaine's stony face and still chest. As his blurry eyes watched her figure some fifty yards away, two milky-white hands shot out from under the ocean like rogue arrows and wrapped themselves around Elaine's chest. Then they pulled, and just like that, Elaine was under the tide. Jerry's legs kicked furiously, and once he was beyond standing depth, he started to swim, arms slicing through the tepid water like small daggers. He started to thrash about, water filling his lungs as he screamed. He started to spurt and retch as he swam, his clothes weighing him down considerably. His jeans felt like 100-pound weights strapped to his legs. He still screamed, and soon his breath was torn out of him like a vacuum. His strokes became slapping open palm thrashes into the water. His legs stopped kicking and his shoulders became limp. He turned to see if anyone on the beach was trying to rescue him, but the shore was gone. There was no beach. There were no people. All around him was ocean, with no sign of civilization anywhere. He tried to scream, but his throat was choking on water. He could start to feel his body sinking, his cries diminishing, his vision blurring. Soon he was looking through a tint of blue, expanding water. Colorful reefs and grinning gray fish situated below him. Then, when the salt water began to sting his eyes, he shut them, and they didn't open again. Jerry shivered violently and swung out from his sleep. He coughed, water spitting out from his gullet. He placed his palms on the solid ground he sat on and jumped in surprise. The ground was freezing cold. He looked down through his teary eyes and saw what he was sitting upon was ice. He got shakily to his bare feet, wincing from the freezing standing place. He looked around and saw he was standing on a towering piece of ice that overlooked the ocean. With more careful examination, he realized he was standing upon a three-story iceberg out in the middle of the Atlantic. Hello, my love. Jerry spun around and his bare feet slipped out from under him. He hit the iceberg hard, bringing stars to his eyes. Standing there on the other end of the iceberg was Elaine, smiling lovingly at him. Her blue eyes shone with her usual breathtaking intensity. Her hands clasped behind her back as she always used to do. Her blouse was no longer bloodstained and her brain was no longer exposed. She was just there, brand new and real. Jerry leapt to his feet and slid to her, taking Elaine in his arms. She was solid and warm. You're alive, Jerry sobbed, his fingers running through her hair. Yes, Gerald, she's alive and well. Jerry tore out of his love's arms and turned to look at a spot that had been empty a second ago. There stood a man dressed in black jeans and a plaid shirt. He had a gold belt buckle that gleamed brilliantly. He wore rubber galoshes and a cowboy hat perched on his head. 
The man grinned, his eyes a terrifying orange. His teeth were gray and rotting. He had the slightest hint of a beard on his face, his arms folded neatly over his chest. Howdy, he said, grinning through his rotting teeth. Jerry grimaced. I had a hand in this, I must admit, he cackled. Nice to meet you, friend, he said, holding out his hand. He was too far away to reach Jerry, though, so he started to slide forward on the ice without moving his feet or legs in any way. When he was in arm's length, Jerry slowly lifted his own hand, and the man clutched it heartily. Still, he grinned. What? What do I want? He asked, his eyes seeming to glow like orange suns. Elaine continued to smile next to Jerry as if she had been reacquainted with an old friend. Well, I did give you back your wife, and then I saved your life. Oh, I'm a poet, and I didn't even know it. He laughed, which didn't sound human one bit. It sounded like a growling chainsaw slicing at metal. Jerry put his hands to his ears and yelped painfully. Next to him, Elaine laughed like a small child. All I want to do is reunite you with your fiancé, and that is all, the man replied, holding out his arms. You can be with her freely without changing yourself drastically. You can be free with her. How did you... But you have to do something for me first, the man said dreamily. What? Jerry asked. He turned to Elaine, who was now grinning. Salt water leaked through her locked teeth. It ran down her cheeks. What did you do to her? Well, that's the price of going into business with me, he said. His face looked different suddenly. It looked waxy, as if it was polished like a jewel. Just a slight casualty, but when I'm done with you, you won't notice at all. What do you mean? Then Elaine grabbed both his hands and secured them behind his back. Jerry screamed into the afternoon sky as liquid hands started to rise up from the murky waters below. They reached out toward the sun, translucent fingers splayed out like large fins. The ocean started to churn, waves crashing at the iceberg brutally like hammers. Whirlpools burst into life all around, sucking at the great crystal dice, and the whirlpools were like mouths filled with jagged teeth. Still, the arms reached out at the sky, rising far above Jerry's head. The man belched laughter in front of him, his face starting to melt. His clothes liquefied like dripping wax and ran off his body. His face became clear like the water, and Jerry could see the black storm clouds starting to stack on top of each other behind him in the sky. Lightning streaked through like jagged cracks in the Earth's atmosphere. The man's eyes sank back into nothing, and his features smoothed like a clean slate. His body then became a tall figure, faceless, and built entirely of clear water. The figure slithered towards him, its lobster-like claws reaching out. Gone fishing, right? The man cackled. Sometimes we wish, after we catch a fish, we could throw them back. But you just can't resist keeping it, am I right? Jerry tilted his head to the side to look at his beloved Elaine, smiling lovingly at him with those glorious eyes, that wonderful perfume wafting up into his flared nostrils. He couldn't leave her. He couldn't depart. He wasn't going to throw her back. Yes, he whispered, his head drooping. The faceless figure laughed delightfully and grasped his shoulders with both of its wet lobster claws. The smooth face of the ocean creature pressed against his own, like a mask. For a moment, Jerry and the man were one, and he knew all the creature's hidden thoughts and mysterious pasts. It had many lives and many faces, but only one name. He was a dealer of the best kind. He was a pusher of the worst kind. And Jerry learned that the hard way. Then the thing's liquid body pressed through his clothes and over his skin like a liquid body suit. Then the world was shut off like a light and all Jerry saw was blue. Elaine was a small dot on the horizon and he ran to her. Where did Elaine get to? Her father growled behind his morning paper. Did she even come home last night? Well, George, we really started something foul last night and I can't blame her for being angry at us. The mother replied dryly. The front door burst open and two figures appeared in the doorway. The parents turned to the sounds of footsteps and the lurking of shadows on the carpet. Elaine? Gerald? Are you? Elaine's father asked. Elaine and Jerry turned the corner and stood in the doorway of the kitchen. Elaine's folks gasped. Elaine and Jerry weren't solid, but clear as water. They looked like spirits that grinned wickedly, and they seemed to melt as well, water pooling around their translucent feet. They both laughed in unison. Water sprang out of their mouth. The old woman cried out. The translucent people slithered forward into the kitchen. The old man belched as wet, solid fingers wrapped around his throat. In turn, Elaine wrapped her tentacles around her mother's wrist. Their cries of pain became gagging gurgles before silence. All there was was blue. 
The ball of fire in the sky started to set in the west, igniting a beautiful blanket of purple to envelop the sky. It threw orange streaks over the ocean's surface, tiny stars of light twinkling and dancing along with the rolling waves. On the beach, two people, a man and a woman, walked toward the shore, heads on each other's shoulders, arms tightly wound together. The two lovers walked into the rising tide, hand in hand, moving into their new home, their new life. The two heads in the ocean finally plunged down into the depths, leaving no sign for anyone to follow, except for the sets of footprints that ran into the crashing waves. And still the waves swept steadily over the beach, erasing the footprints, molding the sand, and making it new. Invitation to an Exorcism as Brett entered the stuffy Victorian-style house in the suburbs of Denver, the smell of pet dander and old antiques immediately transported him to another time, to a secluded discarded cupboard space in his distant childhood, where his most admittedly suppressed fear resided in the form of an old black-and-white grainy video, played and replayed on repeat in his head since he was eight years old. In that faded yet oddly well-aged memory, a ghost girl, transparent blue, in a white dress, strode across the dining room floor in mid-step in only a snapshot image, completely unaware of him. He hoped that this would be his last time entering the house, but he quickly revised that thinking once realizing that he'd have to return at least one more time to drop off his aunt's bulldog at the end of the month. He was there to do a favor for his aunt Julie and make some money in the process. Recently graduating from college, the few hundred dollars would go a long way towards supplementing some of his fees racked up from the expensive trips to the grocery store. And there weren't many other gigs on the horizon besides his usual customers who needed a house-slash-dog sitter. Aunt Julie was his most recent customer, who would be attending a university conference that required the entire psychology department to travel out of state for a few weeks. Thankfully, she didn't need a house-sitter, as Brett had dreaded the five or ten minutes he would have to spend in the doorway of the mansion while his aunt handed off the leash of her bulldog to him. No, he could take the dog with him home, and he was more than happy to take the invitation to gather his check and leave. Aunt Julie greeted him in the parlor, but her bulldog was absent from the scene. The abundance of porcelain dolls staring at him from the nearest glass case were certainly present, and Brett averted his eyes to an oil painting of a stern-looking woman in a red gown, flashing accusatory eyes in his direction, and he quickly stared at his feet. At age 59, Aunt Julie hobbled forward on her cane, her face heavily caked in makeup but youthful all the same, and genuinely bright and smiling at the sight of him. It had been about a year since last Thanksgiving since he'd seen her, and the leg compression and boot on her enlarged foot were somewhat of a surprise for him, although he knew she had complained of a history of gout on several occasions in his company. Brett noticed how cold it was in the parlor, even with all the windows closed and the furnace growling somewhere beneath their feet. The three layers of sweaters and scarf around Julie's neck were at least proof enough that he wasn't overreacting. Brett, Sonny, how long has it been since you've been in my humble abode? Julie asked him, keeping her wide berth. He couldn't help but notice that she wasn't calling for her dog or handing over the check, as he had hoped to begin their conversation. It has to be over ten years, Brett sighed. It can't have been that long, could it? She asked rhetorically, shaking her head and allowing a few slivers of silver bangs to slip free from her hair tie. Surely the night of our last scare wasn't your final visit. No, I think I made it for a couple more Halloween parties before I got too old, he said. Yes, I'm afraid I've grown out of that phase as well, she replied, lost in a memory that Brett thought he was currently sharing with her. You'll be happy to know I haven't used that Ouija board since that night. Brett shrugged, trying to seem nonchalant and inadvertently locking eyes with a glass-eyed doll again. It's just a toy. I had an overreactive imagination then. Come now, we know we both have seen something in this house, she ventured with a raised eyebrow. You didn't tell anyone of the little girl you saw walking across this very floor until you overheard me telling your mom about the same little girl I saw peek around that corner. There. She indicated the half wall separating the living room from the main stairs. I saw her as clear as day, and when she saw me, she booked it up those stairs like I was playing tag with her. You blurted out that you saw the same thing, validating both of our stories. With all the dolls you have, it could be that we both projected the little girl, like a hallucination, Brett offered unconvincingly. Aunt Julie smiled and tapped her cane on the wooden floor. I'm a psychologist. I'm supposed to say things like that to you, she chortled as she neared the cellar door, fingering the knob. 
A ripple of pain coursed through Brett's skull and he had to steady himself against the glass case of dead, staring faces. You know that wasn't the end of it, don't you? Aunt Julie asked. I figured, since you never spoke of it again, that you might have suppressed the rest of your memories of that Halloween night. The remainder of that night was pretty traumatizing for us both. The rest of the night? Brett asked. You and my parents messed around with the Ouija board for fun. But me and my cousins went upstairs to play. We were scared to be in the same room with you. Correction, your cousins went up to play, but I found you in the basement. Aunt Julie said, opening the door and allowing an even colder wind to invade the parlor. The darkness sitting solid and heavy beyond that door was not disturbed in the slightest by the lamplight flickering on the mantle behind them. I've never been down there, but accompanying that unwelcome pain in his head was a memory of a dream he'd had once as a kid, where he had stood on the threshold of those basement steps, looking down on a grinning and silvery black panther at the bottom of the stairs. As soon as it moved to clear the distance between them, Brett had reared out of his sleep with what he could only think was comparable to a heart attack, threatening to break open his ribcage. I heard you screaming down there, and when I went down, you were basically catatonic, unresponsive, and I saw something I'll never forget, something I haven't told anyone. Not your mother, not my late husband, she continued, squaring herself up in front of the solid black doorway. I don't want to hear any more, Brett said with a heaving breath. If I could just get the dog and leave. I'm not going out of town, Brett, she said matter-of-factly, gazing down the steps as he had done in his dream. I only said that to get you here. I need you to do something for me. You lied? She ignored him. I'm not afraid in this house, not anymore. The demon that lives down there knows this. We're attached, it and me. We have been since I was a girl, but it can't scare me anymore. Ever since it took my husband's life, feeding off him like a cancer, I haven't been afraid to die. Being a widow is much worse than death, the greatest torture of them all, and it successfully broke me. Now it's moved on to new victims, unfortunately. Brett, my neighbors. I get calls all hours of the night from Mrs. Tetridge next door, who says she's seeing our little girl running up and down the stairs, but we both know it's not a little girl. I know you saw it too that night, and you fought it successfully. I don't know what, what you're talking about. None of that happened. You're the only one who can help me, Brett, to help my neighbors, because you're like me. Like you? You have a demon inside you, which you've carried for a very long time, I can tell. I have something similar. It's been with me since my mom, God rest her soul, bought me my first child-sized doll at an estate sale. When I brought that doll into the house, I unknowingly let the demon traveling with that doll into my heart. It's been with me ever since. It takes the form of a girl in hopes that we'll drop our guard. But we were never fooled, were we? The nightmare was so bright in his mind now, replaying like an unshakable example of deja vu, which he was no longer convinced was a dream at all. I saw its true form down there in the basement when I came to rescue you, and it was throwing dirt at the floor in front of my feet, cowering there in the corner. I could tell it was cornered. It was intimidated by something you did or something your passenger did. And I looked at it in the face, just briefly. Its snake-like, scaled, greenish face, as its claws tore around its vicinity to throw more dirt at us. And it was gone. I would remember something like that, Brett croaked with a hard swallow. Something that terrifying when you're that young? I've encountered many patients who compartmentalize that kind of trauma. Some of it might bleed out in your dreams. What is your worst nightmare? I know you must have one. Brett thought that the only way to relinquish the building pressure in his chest would be to unclog his throat and speak. I sometimes dream of a panther stalking me, sneering, just before it pounces, and I wake up. She nodded at the new draft that exhaled from the open basement's gaping mouth. That must be your passenger. Ever figure out where it might have latched onto you? Brett swallowed another burning lump. Sometimes in my dreams, it will morph from the black rabid cat that attacked me once in the green melt behind my house. When I was five, I still have the scars on my legs from where it came at me. I'm so sorry, Brett, but I'm going to have to ask you to go down there with me tonight. Why? He begged. Whatever lives inside of you, it doesn't get along with what's inside of me, she replied. In that Halloween night, the activity in the house died off for a very long time, months even, before I finally saw that little girl on the stairs. The doll, my very first one, disappeared that night as well, and I never found it again. I always thought that was the reptile thing covering its bases. He was vulnerable for the first time. I could see it in his little amber eyes down there in the cellar, and I think he wanted to make sure that his totem, the source of his power, was protected from anyone with the wherewithal to harm it. 
or him. I can't be the one to help you, Brett argued. You need a priest or an exorcist. We both do, most likely, Julie countered. But I think you have the next best thing. It's scared, whatever lives down there, more than it ever scared me or my husband. I wouldn't even know what to do. Julie smiled and took his hand. He grudgingly allowed her to lead him closer to the basement, closer to the ice box beyond. Just let your black cat do it for you. Julie led the way, slowly down the creaking steps into the dirt floor at the bottom. She allowed Brett to cling to her sweater, and he felt surprisingly safe pressed to her back, where her steady heartbeat seemed to set the pace for his own jackhammering against her spine. She did not flinch or shake as she reached up to pull the cord on the light bulb above their heads, and they looked around at the unassuming dirt cellar with its haphazard array of boxes and glowing furnace in the corner. It was so cold down there, but Brett felt a pleasant breath of fire against his scalp from the vent directly above him, and he chose to stay there as Julie navigated toward the center of the room. She pointed her cane at the corner opposite the furnace. That's where I saw it. Do you think it's down here now? She frowned, closing her eyes. It's hard to say. It moved around quite a bit, according to what I hear from my neighbors. It could be elsewhere, but it'll show up if we find the doll. You think it's down here still? I don't know where else it could be, she replied. This is where I had it stashed for the longest time, once I realized it was the cause of all the problems. But it was placed on top of one of the boxes there. And yes, I've dug through all the boxes, checked every square inch of this house. It's not anywhere obvious. Maybe you can find it for me. How? Let your cat sniff it out. That's ridiculous. And then what, destroy it? I think I should have destroyed it a long time ago, instead of hiding it down here. But it was my most prized possession, even with all the horror attached to it. I loved it in my own way. I've never heard that destroying cursed objects ever does any good, Brett countered. I thought you had a scientific explanation for everything, Julie pressed with a knowing smile. Why do you think I held on to it for so long? I tend to agree with you. Something that otherworldly most likely requires destruction through otherworldly means. Brett hugged his arms across his freezing chest defiantly and protectively. I don't know what you think I can do. The furnace fired on with such force that they both jumped, and the muscles in Brett's back quickly loosened when the warm air washed over him again. He saw the flaps on one of the boxes moving behind his Aunt Julie, and this almost sent him bolting back up the stairs when he realized the boxes were beneath a second air vent connected to the furnace. However, it seemed that the air coming out of the second grate was much more pronounced, and he circled around his aunt with a look of concentration that led him to the air vent with both arms over his head. He was correct that the air was much fiercer there in the back of the basement than the front. He traced the vent back to his former standing place, motioning for Julie to feel what he was feeling without speaking. As soon as she was positioned under the grate by the stairs, they heard the bulldog Harold begin to bark and tear across the hardwood floor with his nails clicking. He bumped something and it fell hard against the floor, and he continued to bark at the foot of the stairs. We're on to something, Brett breathed quietly. They could not see the dog at the top of the stairwell, but the barks were intensifying and pounding against the eardrums in Brett's head. Above us? Julie asked. In the vent, Brett said. He touched the cold metal of the vent above his head and traced it to the other corner of the basement, to the next grate, and he saw again that even less air was coming through there. Without asking, he extracted the vent cover and peered into the darkness. He saw a glint of light in there, way in the back near the wall, and he knew instinctively that it was a reflection from a glass eye. It's in! The dog's bark died, and they heard him gallop away across the floor above, colliding into something else and falling still. What replaced that void of silence was the sound of something pounding through the vent above their heads, and what could only be considered the laughter of a female child. They could even see the metal crumpling as the heavy weight thundered toward Brett. Grab it! Aunt Julie screamed from somewhere far away, and Brett reached into the dark mouth of the vent, wrapped his fingers around the moth-eaten dress, and wrenched the child-sized thing out of the vent, and then he dropped it to the floor. Gangly, dripping, scaly claws reached after the broken doll on the ground, but closed around Brett's throat instead, lifting him off the ground until the toes of his sneakers were balanced on the dirt. He looked up into the blood-orange eyes and felt the putrid breath waft over his face as it hissed, speckling him with its lava-hot spit. A deep, cat-like growl replied, vibrating with his chest, and the claws withdrew into the darkness just as the black, silvery blur flashed between Brett's legs and scooped up the old doll in its jaws. 
It then proceeded toward the stairs, ripping through the fabric parts of the doll like a dog with its chew toy, and the panther made sure to smash the doll's porcelain face against the stairway wall, and then it carried its kill up the stairs, across the den floor, and through the front door without ever opening it. The thing in the vent screamed, and it was no longer a child's voice, but a dragon, screeching as it died. Brett could hear it slithering away, back toward the furnace, and the smoke that poured out of the grates told Aunt Julie and Brett that the reptile was burning, and then the vent was spitting white ash, dusting the dirt floor as the thing's cries receded into nothing. Aunt Julie was quickly at his side, inspecting his neck as he dusted the ash off his own shoulders. Next, I was going to ask how we were going to rid yourself of your passenger, Aunt Julie said, but I think you might want to hold on to that one. Harold barked from the top of the stairs, as if to remind them both why Brett was there in the first place. They hugged and laughed there in the middle of the basement, and both of them felt lighter, as if for the first time. You can put my check in the mail, Brett said. VR becomes her. I wonder if a warning truly even matters anymore, after everything has already come to its resolution. I didn't listen, as so many of my peers. When the Urban Eagles, as they like to call themselves, started protesting in front of all the Fortune 500 companies and investment firms in our major metropolitan cities, did I heed their warning, or did I just scoff at my TV like the rest of my schoolmates, boiling down their major gripes into one simple soundbite fed to us through our benevolent media? Out of all the sensible talking points they outlined in their picket lines, all we really got out of it was, don't wear the goggles, or you'll never take them off. It was laughable. We all saw the memes where people with oversized VR goggles on their heads were reading satanic symbols and propaganda slogans from eye charts at the doctor's office. Everyone took that slogan, which was slapped across many a picket sign and oversized flag, as something literal. And it was so easy to pass them off when it conjured something so silly and descriptive in the mind's eye. As if the VR goggles would literally clamp down over the back of the head like metal spider legs, never to relax its grip. I, on the other hand, took the advice of the urban eagles as something more metaphorical and spiritual. Sure, I could agree with them that the VR goggles would certainly be a slippery slope where most people would no longer see it necessary to meet each other face to face. Why put on clothes when it can be all done in the virtual space? And why risk making mistakes on your first couple surgeries for those practicing medicine? You don't need cadavers or test patients anymore, not when you can operate a virtual surgical knife. I'd already seen how quickly people's attention spans and social skills had degraded with the onset of the smartphone. Wouldn't virtual reality have an even more dramatic effect? Especially now that every company, business, school, university, and nonprofit were utilizing VR for training purposes? Now anyone graduating from high school, I being one of the most recent, is required to don the VR goggles during a trial period, working with one of the most sophisticated algorithms in the world to pair you with your future career. And the goggles are there for you to practice this new task in the virtual realm, in essence testing the success rate of the algorithm to determine if you are in fact fit for the job, and allowing you to try, explore, and fail within the limits of the job as long as possible during an indiscriminate period that could last up to a year after graduation. Honestly, with everything that I'd heard from the urban eagles, and from what I understood about the dangers of becoming too comfortable in the snares of new technology, I had seen how many of my friends and family were thriving in their new roles as lawyers, bankers, teachers, and the list goes on and on. And the success rate was there, as these were interests my peers already had, and the algorithm was able to pick up on that and choose the perfect simulation for them to play in. And it is like playing, at least that's how it had been described to me. Virtual reality had always been a means of escape and fun for our culture. And as the urban eagles picked up their signs and left society altogether, and as the urban eagles picked up their signs and left society altogether to form homesteading communities in tight-knit circles outside in the reservations set aside for them by the state, we all allowed our future careers to be gamified. And I was one of the first in line. The urban eagles had warned us all that the free goggles provided to us by our schools were one of the loudest warning signs. If something is free, you're the product, they would chant in the streets. But I accepted the gift of those simple plastic goggles, resembling the blinders a snowboarder might wear, and I took them home to strap across my face in my bedroom to complete my assigned homework for the night and to log my two hours for my new job. Most of my friends had logged 100 hours or more, and they were still perfectly able-bodied, enough to know the virtual from the reality, and all of them had been more than able to remove the glasses from their eyes at the end of each session. 
So I strapped on my goggles for the first time there in my bedroom, and I learned there in the virtual waiting room of white light what my assignment was. I'd always wanted to be a writer, contributing a new insight never expressed, or proclaiming my own manifesto slash warning like the urban eagles. I, an 18-year-old woman who had never taken a trade class or applied for a team sport in all of my days at school, was assigned to the job of inspecting and condemning houses. This was quite a blow to my constitution and sensibilities. I had never pictured myself doing physical labor, or anything so mindless and repetitive. I didn't even see why this sort of job would ever need to be programmed, as all I did in my virtual realm, for four hour bursts after school, was walk up to houses in an unexplained abandoned neighborhood, with no context, and spray paint the doors, with either a red X to signify that the house was condemned, or a red zero to show that the house was still being inspected. And part of the job didn't even involve me entering these houses. The written instruction booklet I carried along with me in my digital hands forbade me from ever entering the houses. Isn't that what house inspectors did? They entered houses to see if the home was suitable for living or not. But no, this very useful skill was not part of my initial training. Perhaps it would be after I leveled up. But the booklet outlined to me by address which house would be marked with a red X or zero. All I did, or would ever have to do, is walk to the house, pick it out from the booklet, and spray paint the required symbol across the door, over and over again. And there was no explanation as to why there was never anyone else there in the neighborhood streets with me. There were no signs of catastrophe, no flooding or forest fires or bug infestations. It was simply an empty suburb, identical to my own, and all the houses looked pristine. There didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to tell me why one house would be unsafe compared to its neighbor. And I still went to school every day, trying to find fulfillment in my writing classes and telling no one of my extracurricular experiences. While others recited their very real storylines of arresting felons and rescuing people from flaming buildings in their virtual reality narratives, I was busy spraying doors, like a logger in a forest. And I couldn't help but wonder what the urban eagles were doing at that moment in their perfect convents, far outside the city limits. Still, I was willing to stick it out and log my hours, with no reassurance from anyone living and breathing that my time in this simulated internship would soon be over. I soldiered on and fulfilled my duties as they were outlined in my guidebook, adamant with the fact that it could always be worse and I might have been assigned cleaning up sewers somewhere. At least I got to walk around and exercise my virtual legs in the sun, and it was always a bright and sunny day, so real that I could feel my bare arms and legs tanning as I crossed from porch to porch. I even made a game of it, guessing before each turn of the page in my book which house would be condemned. And I had a 50-50 chance, of course. More often I was right. A lot more houses were condemnable in this neighborhood. Then came the day that I crossed a familiar busy main street in my town, completely void of cars or pedestrians, and ventured into my own neighborhood. I toured through my old haunts with the most unpleasant, uneasy feeling prickling my neck and scalp, and I didn't think it was physical discomfort from the goggles. I walked past my elementary school with its motionless tether balls on chains, proceeding to the grocery store, and I had never seen the parking lot so empty. Not even a breeze had been programmed into my scene to trace the clouds across the sky or stir the bits of trash in the gutters. It was as if I was frozen in time, just me, my uniform, a notebook, and a spray can. As instructed by the book, I began to tag the houses, some of them my neighbors and old friends from middle school I hadn't kept up with in years. I began to notice that the houses I was marking with the X were more often than not those of my classmates, who were all undergoing the VR training program like me. I marked them all as condemned. And then I was there at my own house, and I almost wanted to stop there, forego the time restraints and rip the goggles off my face, never to wear them again, and ready to skip town and join the eagles in their anarchist sex in God's green earth, as we were meant to be. But I flipped the page in the notebook and saw that my door was to be inscribed with that fateful X. I'd like to tell you that this was all I had to see, and that I did exactly as I threatened previously, throwing away my future career with those free gaming goggles. But I walked up the front steps of my front porch and marked my door like all the rest, satisfying my slotted time for the day and allowing me to free my eyes and go to bed. But I never did fall asleep that night, and I couldn't help but wonder how free the code of this program was. What was to stop me from walking through the front door of my own virtual house? Would it be locked? Would the game time out with a massive game over scrolling across my vision? Or would I open that door and see just zeros and ones? Empty program space. 
I had to know. So at close to midnight on that school day, I sat up on the corner of my bed and strapped the goggles across my face once again. I entered my neighborhood scene, but now at night, as I would expect to find right outside my own physical window. And the street lights were buzzing above my head. The porch light on my house was on, as my mom always left it. And there was the sloppy and dripping red X that I had marked it with. With my heart thumping in my throat, either in my virtual one or in my physical, I can't say which, I cautiously approached my front porch and tried the door. It was locked, again, thanks to my mom's diligence. But I was quick to drop the paint can slash notebook from my other hand and reach into my back pocket of my work shorts. There was my wallet, and in it I found the spare key to my front door, exactly in the secret pocket where I had always stashed it. I inserted the key and pushed open the door. I held my breath, expecting the worst, but I only saw my ordinary living room, which I had always taken for granted. Every time I came home after school, there was the half-finished puzzle on the coffee table that my brother had started the afternoon before, and there was the glass of water I had left by the sink. Now, feeling like a dreamer outside of her body, I crept up the stairs, which made all the right creaks and all the right spots, and I wondered if I should be careful, or else risk waking my parents in the nearest bedroom at the top of the stairs, but I passed that off as silly. This was a video game. So I charged the rest of the way down the hall and pushed open my bedroom. There I was, sitting on the edge of the bed with my head bowed slightly, staring into nothing with a twitching lower lip and hands resting palms down on my pajama legs. It was such a strange feeling to look at myself like that, so I snapped out of it and tried to remove the VR goggles from my head with my physical hands, but all I could do was move my digital hands and I touched my naked head of hair where there was no restraining strap to be found. I began to panic, closing my eyes to snuff out that virtual space as best I could, willing for my mind to return to my physical body, sitting there in the bed with my hands in my lap. But I couldn't conjure that real scene, no matter how hard I tried. And I ran to the bed, shaking my physical self and grappling with the goggles across her face. She lolled onto the bed like a broken doll, and I had to help her lay down as I struggled with the strap across the back of her head. But the clasp was locked, or stuck, as I had never encountered before. I started to scream then, calling for my mom, dad, and my brother, but no one came to the doorway, no matter how high I raised my volume. I was about to give up and run to my brother's room next door when light suddenly filled my shaded window from the other side, and I opened the blinds to see a vehicle was snailing into my cul-de-sac from the adjoining road, as big as a street sweeper and just as slow. But its bright headlights on the front of its chassis shot crazy jagged shadows across my neighborhood, as bright as a train spotlight, and eerily white, as white as the waiting room in the VR space when I was first assigned my job. And this vehicle was not driving along the street, but along the sidewalk, seemingly passing through the fire hydrants and recycle bins on the curb as if it wasn't actually there at all. And I could hear it now, a rattling, clunking, wheezing sound that was accentuated by hissing pistons and releases of air. I couldn't make out any identifiable markings on the vehicle as it shambled closer due to its invasive spotlight. And it paused at each house before trolling on, and I knew why. I had marked all of my immediate neighbor's houses in the cul-de-sac with zeros, which meant their homes were safe for now. Only mine had the X, and as soon as the vehicle was in front of my driveway, I could see that there were no markings on its sleek silver body, and there were no windows or windshield, only that adjustable spotlight, which swung around to blind me and fill my window once again. I ducked down and the light disappeared, but the clunking, hissing, chortling intensified and I peeked over the sill to watch the vehicle, its light extinguished, turn like a swivel chair to face my front door. Its chrome cowcatcher was now directed at the front porch like the tip of a spear, and it began to creep forward onto the front lawn and up to my mother's well-manicured garden path. It didn't move on tires but what looked like a million centipede legs, leaving a trail of dead grass behind it. I watched as a trunk door opened in the back and someone stepped out. I seized with surprise to see that it was an exact copy of me, but not the me in my work uniform, but the me in my red plaid pajama pants and must up hair. That version of me stood by the mailbox, patiently waiting with a dead expression as the armored vehicle crept up the porch. And from the unmistakable creaking I could hear on the stairs directly outside my room, I knew the thing had passed through the front door without opening it and was closing in quickly. Although I understand everything now, I didn't fully perceive the true motives of that machine in that moment, and I only thought about gathering up my body in that split second between the loudest crack on the top stair and the first eye contact I made with the waiting double outside my house, and I saw that she was smiling. I wish I had gathered up my sleeping self in my arms to take with me, but in that fight or flight moment, all I could think to do was run into my closet, push up the attic door in the ceiling, and claw my way up into the asbestos-laden crawlspace. 
I listened to the thing as it bumped into my room below me, a mechanical muttering and chortling all too clear now, as it either recited its inner monologue or responded to some far-off instructions. I heard it pause considering air hissing before its little legs were clattering again, and I heard the bed creak as it no doubt interacted with it. What it did with my body, I cannot say, and whatever it did, it was not enough to unplug me from the virtual reality I had found myself in, and I did not wait to learn how it would make its escape or listen to hear if the imposter outside would then come into my room and sleep in my bed, pretending to be me. I crawled to the other side of the attic, pushed through the vent cover in the back, and scaled the roof so that I could jump down into my backyard. I didn't look over my shoulder or try to alert anyone I thought might be alive in my childhood home. I ran and ran until I was well outside of the city, without ever stopping for a bite to eat or a drink of water, and never tiring, as those limitations no longer affected me there in my body, whose skin would never burn in the sun, and whose breath never failed her lungs. I was even blessed to find one of those urban eagle communes, and I inspected their empty yurts and thumbed through their endless stockpiles of storable foods, guns, and water jugs. But I never found another soul. I'm still waiting for one, but I don't expect to find anyone anytime soon. At least not any eagles. They had been the smart ones and never touched the VR goggles as many of us had done, and they had been so right, literally. The goggles weren't meant to ever be taken off. No, the eagles weren't programmed to be in this world with me. I can only hope that someone had bucked the system just enough like I had and maybe peered through their dark glasses outside of their normal work hours, at midnight or later, when the chrome creature went to collect its condemned souls. I can only hope that person had made their escape like me, free from their goggles and free from their physical body, and I can only hope they'll come looking for their slice of paradise out here in the woods, as the urban eagles had promised, perhaps not to find full protection in the form of prepped stockpiles, but another lost soul to wait out eternity with while the great underground servers and processors are still pumping out enough power for this realm to render as realistic pixels in front of my quote-unquote eyes. And still I wait, and even though I do not sleep, I dream. Tune in next time for Tales from the Cracks, number 16 through 18. Starting with The Artificial Eye in the Sky, followed by the haunting is hers, and concluded with the eclipse of the dragons. Until next time, guard your soul.